Welcome. This is presentation number three in our series, Rereading the Fourth Gospel, the story of Jesus the Revealer. And we are now jumping to the beginning of the book. We're going to cover the prologue, the first 18 verses in the book. So <clears throat> there is a rereader advantage. We want to uh, stress that. There is a reason why we why we stress uh, <coughs> rereading, that is to say that you can know the ending of the book before you begin it. So you go over it and after a while we get to see the whole in a better way. So while the prologue may be read as an introduction, it reads even better as a conclusion, a summary of the story told. Use it as an introduction. You won't really understand the introduction till you've read the whole thing. <coughs> you read it then at the end as a conclusion, and everything is much more uh, clear. <coughs> and it may well have been written last, even though it comes first. So you could say, well, he wrote it as an outline. This is what I want to cover in my book. That's possible. It's also possible that he wrote it afterwards. <coughs> to sort of give, give a, a uh, uh, yes, as, a f <coughs> as you do, as I know some people have to do, in, in, uh, and I have done it too in my uh, books. You, read, you write the foreword at the end, as it were, and you could say that that is maybe what he did. So the poetic, melodious tenor of the prologue, is proof of a mature, masterful, confident, and loving reflection on the topic. Let me say that again. Mature, masterful, confident, and loving. Because there, there is an emotional tenor, a feeling invested in the prologue. And so my last point, it can be read as a tribute in that case, a tribute to the revealer by the beloved disciple. That's how it reads. I will now <coughs> propose to read through every verse, the 18 verses of the prologue. If I succeed when I <coughs> process this, this video, I will put a little bit of music in the background. I don't know if I'll succeed. I'll put a little bit of music in the background from an other overture, another prologue, as it were, to a musical piece, just to see <coughs> if we can evoke something else from the way this runs. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him. And without him, not one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness, to witness to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to witness to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. 
John testified to him and cried out, This was the he of whom I, sent, I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God the only begotten, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. That's the prologue. And again, if I were to go back to my things here, you can see that it reads as a tribute to the subject of the story. And the subject of the story is the revealer. <coughs> We're now going to do it in detail, <coughs> to do it verse by verse, and beginning with the opening verse, in the beginning, and I am using the translation of the New Revised Standard, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And <coughs> so what, what do we get from it? And we, you might say that should be easy, that should be uh, that, that's not a big problem. The terms are simple, but you will see that it isn't quite as easy. But one thing is quite easy. Let's do the easy part first. So here I am quoting <coughs> from this two-volume commentary by Ernst Henchen uh, in the Hermeneia commentary series, which is maybe the most upscale of all uh, uh, commentaries, uh, New Testament and Old Testament commentaries. <coughs> so what does he say? He says that like Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, uh, it begins uh, with an ahe in the beginning. That is no mere coincidence. The agreement is international. But the differences are much greater than the, than uh, the scar this scarcely accidental congruence. So the Gospel of John begins like the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible. So that is established. But let's see, there is, so there is a similarity there, but there is also a difference, he says. Genesis 1.1 narrates an event, God creates. John 1.1, however, tells of something that was in existence already. In time primeval, astonishingly, it is not God. So he doesn't say God there, but he does say that the, what is there in the beginning is something that precedes creation. The hymn does not, uh, does not begin with God and his creation, but with the existence of the Logos in the beginning. So establishing the connection with Genesis is important and let's do one more uh, witness to that effect. This is Rudolf Bultmann from his magisterial commentary on the Gospel of John that is still uh, <coughs> revered, that commentary. It would be hard for the evangelist to begin his work with in the beginning without thinking of in the beginning of Genesis 1.1. We get the point. Thank you. <coughs> That's established. So, <coughs> but <coughs> we have another problem. We have Logos. In the beginning was the Logos. So, in the beginning was the Word. How do we do justice to that, knowing that Logos has a wide semantic range? It can mean uh, more than uh, one thing. <coughs> so, uh, here I should refer to Craig Keener, who is a uh, <coughs> contemporary uh, interpreter of the Gospel of John. He has written a two-volume uh, commentary <coughs> that is also highly regarded. He says, well, there is a Gnostic <coughs> logos. That was a concept in Gnosticism, which was a first or second century uh, religious philosophical movement. <coughs> Secret knowledge mediated by a revealer figure. And Bultmann was tending to see the Logos of John as a kind of Gnostic Logos. <coughs> and then there is a Hellenistic Logos, more 
you know, platonic, you might say, which is thought or rational principle, also mediated by a divine messenger. Or you have Philo's Logos. Philo was a Jewish theologian, philosopher living in Alexandria at the time of Jesus and the Apostle Paul. And he was heavily influenced by Greek philosophy. So in his Logos there is a mixture of Platonism and Stoicism. And, but it also gravitates toward reason. It's very rational. And then you have the concept of Jewish wisdom. Jewish wisdom, Old Testament wisdom as the word of God. Logos as Torah, God's revelation. And that's what Keener will advocate, what he will uh, promote. And I think he is onto something. <coughs> I don't think it is fully, fully matured, but it is a step in the right direction. It's better than those other options. <clears throat> Playing on the link between Torah and wisdom. The fourth gospel presents <coughs> the logos of its prologue as Torah, <coughs> embodied Torah. That's what he will do. Well, <coughs> what I will do next now is not to be seen as a digression. I mean it to be part of the of the presentation, but it could be seen as a digression. Here is <coughs> one of the greatest writers in the history of Germany. Uh, this is Goethe, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who, was, who lived here in uh, 1749 to 1832. He is probably the highest, the, the uh, German writer most highly regarded. Certainly his book Faust Goethe's Faust is a, uh, just at the pinnacle of German literature, Faust is an epic poem similar to John, Wilt uh, John Milton's Paradise Lost. And in Norwegian, what would it be similar to in Norway? It would be similar to Henrik Ibsen's Brand or some other book written entirely on rhyme. That's the key. That's not easy to do. Uh, and in Faust, we have Faust wrestling one day in his study with the text of the Gospel of John. He wants to translate the Gospel of John into German. Now, I cannot do this in German. I have read it in German and I like the German version much better than the English translation. So I have to do this in English now for us, for our purpose. And Goethe was a very influential person. He was also a great charmer. This is a picture of Goethe ice skating with a lot of admiring women around him. <coughs> so this is a figure who really, he cut a striking, striking figure in his time. <laughs> but here is from Faust. He is looking and reading the Gospel of John. He's reading the prologue. And here is in, in one English translation <coughs> what he will do. He opens a volume and commences. Tis written, in the beginning was the Word. Here I am barked, I am stymied, I am sort of, you know, a little challenged. Who now can help afford the Word? Impossible, so high to rate it and otherwise I must translate it. If by the Spirit I am truly taught, then thus in the beginning was the thought. This first line let me weigh completely, lest my impatient pen proceed too fleetly. Is it thought which works, creates indeed? In the beginning was the power, I read. Yet, as I write, a warning is suggested that I sense may not, that, that I the sense may not have fairly tested. The Spirit aids me. Now I see the light. In the beginning was the act. So here in Goethe's wrestling with the Logos, there is word, there is thought, there is power, and there is act. And which one of those is the best one? Well, he thinks in the beginning was the act.
That's what we should have translated. I'll give you one more, read it through quickly. This is another translation, <coughs> similar. In the beginning was the word, here now I'm balked. Who will put me in a cord? It is impossible, the word so high to price. I must translate it otherwise. If I am rightly by the Spirit taught, tis written, in the beginning was the thought. Consider well that line, the first you see, that your pen may not write too hastily. Is it then thought that works creative, hour by hour? Thus should it stand, in the beginning was the power. Yet even while I write this word, I falter. For something warns me, this too I shall alter. The Spirit's helping me. I see now what I need, and right assured. In the beginning was the deed. Now, this is not just a waste of time or a digression. Word, thought, power, deed, those are legitimate options. And they are actually options that have been suggested by other scholars for the meaning of the Logos in the Gospel of John. And uh, so the notion that there is <coughs> embodied Torah, which is more biblical and more specific, might, what, where does that fit? It fits with, fits with word, it fits with deed. And word and deed are very close in Hebrew thought. So that is not bad. Okay, it's my turn. It's my turn. And I'm serious. I'm not playing games here. <coughs> so here is me. I am now Goethe's Faust sitting at my desk. And I'm <coughs> waiting for the light to shine. Just like he was, you know, and trying out options. And here is how I wish to translate it. In the beginning was the revealer. And the revealer was with God. And the revealer was God. Now, I am serious. I will propose this among scholars, whoever it may be. <coughs> and I will defend it like this. This is fits with the concept of logos. It's a communicating word, a revealed, revealing word. And what the revealer is in the gospel. He is in the gospel, the revealer. He is called that in the prologue. And then you have the idea, you have preserved that the revealer is a person before he becomes a human being. In his godness, he is already a person, not a word only, but a real person. So personhood in his pre-existence is preserved, and there is fulfillment here of Old, Old Testament intimation. So <coughs> let's do it without any sort of inhibitions here. See that? In the beginning was the revealer. That's how we want to start this book. That's how we start the prologue. And just a few corroborating thoughts here for that, because in the getting the Logos right, now looking at the content of the book later on, we have Jesus saying <coughs> in one contentious exchange, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will realize that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own, but I speak these things as the Father instructed me. So here, Jesus uses a strange term. When, I, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, you will understand. But he is actually talking about himself as a revealer, drawing on an Old Testament text, to that effect, see my, this is from Isaiah 52 that we will <coughs> cover later in, when we get to further on in the, in the story. My servant shall prosper, he shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high, just as there were many who were astonished at him. 
so <coughs> marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations, kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. These, this text describes revelation by someone who is a revealer. And when you have lifted up the Son of Man, you will understand that he is that revealer who is described in Isaiah. That's how simple it is. And then <coughs> he is also the pre-existent Logos in the store here is the story of Abraham on his way to Mount Moriah to sacrifice Isaac uh, in a uh, late or in an early 15th, 16th century uh, depiction here. <coughs> and then the subject comes up in another very contentious discussion in the Gospel of John. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? The prophets also died. Who do you claim to be? Jesus answered, your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. That's the story where he saw the day. That's what John thinks he saw. Then the Jews said to him, you are not 50 years old and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. So there is a pre-existent Logos who is an I in his pre-incarnational reality. He is a person before he becomes the incarnate Logos, as it were. So he is a revealer all along. And then <coughs> one more, and this is uh, another discussion about Moses. So here the idea that he is Torah embodied. So I want to support that. I do agree with that. So here is Rembrandt's Moses and the discussion. <clears throat> you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that testify on my behalf. <laughs> do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom you have set your hope. If you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. But if you do not believe what he wrote, how will you believe what I say? So here is Isaiah, here is Abraham, here is Moses, and they are all in support <coughs> of the thought that Jesus in the Gospel of John is the revealer. <coughs> he is the one who brings the light of God into our world. <coughs> He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of all people. So <clears throat> he was in the beginning. He has no beginning himself. There was never a time when he was not. And he is the creator of all things, and life and light are fused. Life has itself a luminous quality. And light is a term for revelation. I think we can say that and be confident. <coughs> we read on. <coughs> the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not defeat it. Here are two alternatives. Well, the light, it shines in the darkness, in a dark world, in a world made dark for some reason. So here, alternative one, which is the one to be preferred, the darkness did not manage to seize it. That's, and that is also the message of the book, even though there is a struggle for the light to get the upper hand, it will do it. It will win. It will succeed. <clears throat> now there is another message in the book and that is also appropriate in some ways 
for a translation. The darkness did not comprehend it. The darkness did not receive it. There is a pushback as well, but we will go with this one. Uh, and then, <coughs> uh, <coughs> so, uh, looking at this text more detailed, <coughs> there is a dualism of good and evil in this book. A dualism of light versus darkness. And that dualism is explicit here, light versus darkness, and <coughs> that is explicit. There is even the notion of a battle, that the darkness tried to seize it, to suppress it, to defeat it, but the light won. So the notion of a battle. But then there is also an implicit dualism, and this is a, a point where I think is quite uh, not made or not seen or not understood even by those who, <coughs> who do very good work on, on, uh, on John. Glory is a term for the good. What is it, what's its counterpoint? What is the counterpoint to glory? If glory means to speak well of someone or to glorify someone is to speak well of that person, then the counterpoint to glory is to speak evil of someone. And the gospel knows that there was someone who spoke evil. So there is glory and there is its opposite, uh, slander, misrepresentation. There is life, the counterpoint to that is death, and there is gift. And the counterpoint to gift is the withholding of gift. So God is represented in this book as someone who gives gifts. But in the dualistic framework, God would be seen by the evil side as someone who doesn't give gifts, who withholds gifts. And much as I admire these books, Jörg Frey's book, The Glory of the Crucified One, or Richard Bockham's wonderful book, The Gospel of Glory, I actually think that they have under-projected and have not fully seen the reson, the chamber, the sounding chamber in which this message of glory plays out. So <coughs> then <coughs> it's like from this lofty poetic, uh, what should I say, pinnacle in the, in the book that opens the prologue, we are back to earth in a sense. <laughs> there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. So the prologue of the gospel gives playing room to John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God. His name was John. It's John the Baptist. We know him from the synoptics we get to know far more about him in the Gospel of John. And here is John the Baptist in a depiction preaching to, <coughs> to people. And then, <coughs> so what, <coughs> what should we do here? The notion that he was a witness, and there is a strong, strong uh, emphasis on that. He came as a witness to witness <coughs> so that all might believe through him. Uh, so, John the Baptist is important enough to get a place in the prologue. Not bad. The prologue ascribes importance to him because he was important. So, there is nothing strange there. And then he was not the light, it says. Indeed, he wasn't. But <coughs> the negation, why do you need to say that he was not the light? You need to say it because someone actually thought that, that he was. He was seen as that. He had to, to uh, deny it. And the true light, <coughs> which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was into, in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own did not accept him. And here we can talk about the magnitude of the task, how difficult it was. Light is a metaphor for illumination, for revelation. The light is a revealer. That's not so hard. 
there is alienation between the world and the one who created the world. He came to his own. He came to the world and the world had been created by him and there is alienation. They don't recognize each other or the world doesn't recognize him. How so? Why is that? An alienation between the one who comes to his own and those he regard as his own. But to all who received him, he gave power to become children of God. To those who believed in his name, those who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will uh, of man, but of God. And here we have the prospect that God creates a new family, a community. This is one of the themes of the gospel. Creating a community matters. And the community is independent of blood. It's not conceived along national lines, blood lines, family lines, tribal ideas. That's amazing because that's how gods and people relate in antiquity. So entry into the community is not natural and this anticipates a conversation Jesus will have with Nicodemus on the how supernaturally people be become get born into this family. I want to do a quotation here <coughs> from Gail O'Day, one of the great John scholars of her generation, our generation, our time, uh, who sadly died of a <coughs> glioblastoma in 2018. Uh, and uh, she has written extensively on John and was also the editor of the Journal of Biblical Literature for a while. I like this one. <coughs> father language in John is essentially relational. God is father because Jesus is God's son. This language then is not primarily the language of patriarchy, but instead the language of incarnation, relationship and family. From the very beginning of the gospel, the explicit purpose of Jesus' ministry has been to create a new family of God. And it's in the prologue. We just read it. The promise in these verses is that a new family will be born. A family determined by faith, not by flesh and blood relationships. People who have no families, who come from destructive families, who are alienated from their birth families, can belong to a new family by virtue of becoming children of God. That's nice, because that's reality, that there are family relations aren't always so great. <laughs> and the revealer became flesh, sarks, and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. <coughs> so emphasis here on the notion of fullness. The revealer was a person before he became a human being. This is less explicit in translations that render logos word. I have made that point already. I'll make it one more time. And <coughs> uh, that he pitched his tent among us. He dwelt among us. He pitched his tent among us. That's sanctuary language. Uh, and the means of contact between God and Israel is actualized in the revealer, the tent, the sanctuary, the temple service. And glory is splendor, beauty, and here it is also character, the character of God revealed through Jesus. <clears throat> I have a conversation here, I'm going to read from it, between Gail O'Day who is unfortunately deceased. She is responding to Craig Coaster, who has written extensively on John and on the book of Revelation too. And <clears throat> she disagrees somewhat with him. And I think the disagreement she has with him is a good one. It's legitimate. I agree with her, if I may say so. <clears throat> so I'd just like to highlight it. For the Gospel of John, the defining theological uh, category is and remains the Incarnation. 
For John, <coughs> the incarnation is not an emptying. It is a moment of fullness. That's hard to see that. You know, he comes in to become a human being. But it isn't, it's fullness, not emptying. That's what she sees here. When the word becomes flesh, flesh it is at that moment redeemed. We might disagree slightly with her next sentence, but she has a reason for saying it. Jesus' death is not necessary to redeem humanity. He redeems flesh by becoming flesh. Flesh is now the habitation of the holy. Human flesh is now the embodiment of God in the world. The presence of God dwells in the flesh, not in the Shekinah of the wilderness tabernacle or of the Holy of Holies. These are enormous claims. And she wants to make the incarnation the category of revelation that is most important. It isn't just the death of Jesus that matters. It is also the life of Jesus. That is what she wishes to, uh, to say. And, and then to continue, she makes a concession to Coaster. Coaster makes a very helpful distinction in his paper between what, God, what John presupposes and what the gospel argues. It, in announcing uh, the incarnation, John presupposes and does not argue that the word become flesh will die. Jesus will die. It's not like you take that off the screen. One of the marks of the flesh of a human life is mortality. By becoming flesh, the word, the word joins humanity in its mortality. So it's not like she will take the death of Jesus out of the equation, and we shall certainly not do that in our course. And John doesn't do it. But the Word became flesh. The Revealer became flesh. That is a big statement. And from that revelation, <coughs> we have seen his glory. John the Baptist, one more time, <coughs> John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. So again, another <coughs> slight thing on John the Baptist. And then <coughs> the notion that God is made known by the Logos, by the Revealer. From his fullness we have all received, gift upon gift. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. God, the only Son who is in the Father's lap, or close to the Father's heart, has made him known, has explained him, has exegeted him. <clears throat> so here, note <clears throat> the language of gift and fullness. God is a giving person in this book. Fullness means something given in its entirety. Moses foreshadows Jesus Christ. We move from Torah to embodied Torah. The text is not a put down of Moses. It doesn't say Moses is unimportant. Jesus says he testified of me. <coughs> and yes, Jesus is the revealer here. That is so clear from this text that he is the one who has revealed him. So why shouldn't we not translate confidently in the beginning was the revealer. <clears throat> Another one from Gail O'Day. The language of love is a different ethical language from the language of discipleship found in the Synoptic Gospel. It is a language of fullness rather than a language of emptying. One will give one's life for one's friends as an act of love in 1513, not as an act of self-denial or sacrifice, as it is understood in the Synoptic Gospels. In John, one gives out of the abundance of one's love, not out of the denial of one's self. This is hard to grasp, and I have a presentation late in the course 
on uh, called ambushed by abundance for the very end we'll see what comes together there <coughs> one more point before we go to our <coughs> conclusions so there is a book uh, published not so long ago called John's Gospel and Intimations of Apocalyptic. Apocalyptic is a term for revelation. The last book of the New Testament is called the Apocalypse. So you get the idea that this is a certain kind of revelatory literature. The person who has proposed this notion of, a, of intimations hints of apocalyptic in the Gospel of John is John Ashton who died in 2016 and was one of Britain's foremost uh, John scholars. I just want to listen into what he says in a chapter <coughs> in this book. And yet, and yet, because there is, the thought has been that there, to the worlds of the Gospel of John and the world of the book of Revelation, they are worlds apart, totally unrelated, totally different. And yet, and yet, however far we were to extend this list, the list of ideas about the Gospel of John, there is one theme we would search for in vain, the one that Bultmann had rightly singled out as the Gospel's Grundkonzeption, its foundational idea, its central idea, what was it? The theme of Revelation. So, between the interstices of what might have looked like a tightly woven uh, net covering all the interlocking themes of God's, John's elaborate Christology, uh, the biggest theme of all had slipped through undetected. Lists have been made of the themes of the Gospel of John. And John Ashton is saying that the list is incomplete. The biggest theme was not covered. They missed it. And thus he wishes to say that the world of the Gospel of John, the theme of revelation in the Gospel of John, is not that different from the theme of revelation in a book called the Book of Revelation. These are converging worlds, and one might do Revelation even better than the book called the Book of Revelation. That would be this book. So <coughs> we have to uh, uh, just see a couple of examples of this. <coughs> Revelation, the theme of Revelation in the Gospel of John, there is an open heaven, you will see heaven opened. That's typical of Revelation language. And the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. We have the notion of inbreaking, something that happens suddenly and unexpectedly. That's also typical of apocalyptic thought here by the well. The woman will say, I know that when the Messiah comes, he will disclose everything to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. This is a moment of revelation. At the tomb, after Lazarus has died, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day, she says. Martha says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life now in the present and there is a text about a voice from heaven to show that the theme of revelation in this book is its theme and is similar to other books that herald <coughs> that theme in review the prologue previews and reviews its subject and errand it will tell us the story of the revealer. <coughs> the revealer is important and so is what he reveals. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. John the Baptist is conspicuous in the prologue. The beloved disciple may once have been his disciple and may have thought that John the Baptist was the light. 
I'm speculating here, but possible. Key themes are in, uh, terms are introduced, light shining in darkness, glory, gift, fullness, and membership in a new family. The story has a purpose that all might believe. And the fourth gospel, like another book that tradition ascribed to John, is a book of Revelation. 